Alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. Hello, everybody. This is technically speaking my 100 subscriber episode or stream, whichever one you see first, the re-upload or this live stream, it is 100 sub time. And for me, uh, I'm a bum ass whoologist, as you can tell. And yeah, I never thought that I would get to this level. Like I, I that is a really low bar to set, I know. But I never actually, let me scoot over this way. I never actually expected to even get like 10 subscribers. Like I thought I would just give these unhinged rants and they would just be my, my own little personal vault. So even though the the typical crew that usually ends up sliding through like 30 minutes to an hour in isn't here, I just still want to thank everybody if they do rewatch this for leaving a chat, leaving a suggestion dropping a like, even just actually watching the video for longer than five minutes, I'm like that click through impression rate, bro, that, that, that matters. So I thought for my hundred episode or hundred subscriber episode that I would uh, cover some current events. I think that it's one thing to kind of keep hammering the same points over and over again when it comes to xenozoology. But one thing I think is fascinating is some of the implications coming out recently. And I mean, recently, recently involving the potential for extraterrestrial life. So I'm going to be covering some videos and articles about some of the recent events and basically giving people who don't want to go down the whole rabbit hole, basically just a quick rundown of what the field of xenozoology is looking at right now. So right now we have one kind of promising planet for life, and I'm going to cover that guy. But we also have a heap of other people, as people very well may know, there was the whole CIA whistleblower aliens in my basement type of Indiana Jones stuff that was going on just not too long ago. A couple of weeks ago, people were watching that. And now we have aliens in the Mexican Congress being showed off and people are saying that it's a hoax. I remember a few people have called it out. I, I don't know. I think like Penguinzo called it out. I think the Jacksepticeye guys called I, I don't know. Either way, like I kind of see the same handful of people trying to cover these kind of things. And I think I'll just do more. I, I mean, even though I live stream for longer, it doesn't take an entire episode to explain, oh, these, these are a hoax. So I do want to start with the things that are more promising because with, with everything that's big, like some things are genuinely big, founded in science and irrefutable and other things are just kind of dumb. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show off this video here. So this is, um, I'll, I'll enlarge this for y'all here and this video. And again, I don't play any of the audio for my videos. I don't know if people are going to come in retroactively and complain about that because they're like, Oh, well duh, dead air. And you know, I can mime and make like oh, reaction video sounds to this. But what I'm going to do is essentially just go through the videos. I'm going to put on the captions and we'll go through this at double speed. This is typically how I uh, run this down. So let me see. Let's boost that to two times speed. We're going to slap on those soup titles and we're going to go to town. So this is basically talking about a exoplanet. Oh, so it has all the aliens and stuff. So this is basically talking about an exoplanet that may very well harbor life based on some of the bi biosignatures that we see there. So some of the biosignatures that we see. Yeah, so they're talking about the biosignatures now. I can slow this down since it doesn't have to be this fast. We'll put it at 1.25. That's fair. So a lot of it is just build up and anticipation, but I think they pointed to some dimethyl sulfide, if my memory is correct, dimethyl sulfide and some other, because they know it's a high sea and world. And I remember I talked about high sea and worlds in the last installment of Xenozoology, basically an ocean planet. And so it's 2.6 times the earth, 8.6 times the mass, orbits a red dwarf star called K20H but is in the habitable zone. Remember what I said about the red dwarves is that the biggest issue with them is that to get close enough to the star to receive sufficient amounts of radiation to keep the planet able to hold liquid water, it usually results in higher amounts of UV radiation as you get closer to the corona of the red dwarf. 
So the habitable zone of the red dwarf is much closer to a red dwarf star than it would be to a yellow dwarf star like ours. So what we're doing is like in a nutshell, what this guy's running down is that they wait for the planet to pass in between the sun as it, and itself. And they can tell by how much different parts of the spectrum dip in the data. They'll take an entire spectrometry and they'll notice by how much it dips, like what different types of compounds are in the atmosphere, which is pretty ingenious because water gives off a very specific wavelength frequency in, in this measurement. So just as you can see, like, because if you use a spectrometer, like they have spectrometers, you'll see the different, different compounds will glow different colors. Like helium, for example, is kind of almost like neon kind of pinkish magenta color. And you can see the different spectrums for each different type of compound. So that's what they're doing here. And there might be interference like the, these, these are very fine instruments and the entire field is very, very much in its infancy, but there's pretty strong reason to believe that um, some of these biosignatures is, and how they're measured is fairly legit. It's not like the background radiation thing where it's like you look in all directions within a solar system blasted by radiation and be like, oh, I know what background radiation looks like in the rest of the universe. Like, no, you don't, kid. No, you don't. You're completely bathed in radiation. It's like you're not even outside of the local cluster. Like you're not in some dead point of space. You're being blasted by radiation from all sides. You're saturated with radiation. It's like the myth of the vacuum of space. They go up to the orbit. They take the the data and they're like, oh, yeah, proof. But this is pretty good. Like, let me see. I accidentally pressed space bar. I think it wasn't. So here you see... Uh, in, in the spectrometer, you get these spikes that correlate to the spectral color or frequency of these uh, different compounds. So what they showed here just a couple seconds ago, maybe they'll go through it more, but they're showing that, okay, you can see methane, you can see CO2, but you also see dimethyl sulfide. And dimethyl sulfide it's only produced by life. So on September 12, 2023, NASA announced that their investigation to exoplanet K218b revealed the possible presence of dimethyl sulfide, noting, quote, on Earth, this is only produced by life. So is there a way for, because you have entire clouds made of acetone in space. Is there a way that dimethyl sulfide could have been made by life uh, on this planet? Yes. Is there a way that dimethyl sulfide could have been made by inorganic processes on this planet? Yes. Saying that, oh, we don't have it on Earth, ergo, it, it's like it only comes about via life forms on Earth, ergo, it cannot exist on this planet. Like the one about iridium. Iridium also doesn't naturally occur on this planet. Are you saying that finding iridium on in some other place, like what, what is Earth lack then? Like you, there's materials that are rare on Earth that are abundant other, uh, in other places in, in the universe. And you don't know quite enough about the early formation of the universe or galaxies or planets to definitively say that dimethyl sulfide can only be it's like a necessary versus sufficient condition in philosophy. In philosophy, a necessary condition is one that is completely dependent on said outcome, such as saying that, you know, the all blank are, are so all blank are blank, but not all blank are blank. That is essentially delineating the necessary and sufficient conditions. So a condition that is sufficient to explain the phenomenon, not necessary to explain the phenomenon. So what's an example? Like, all wives are female, but not all females are wives. Or not, they're like all wives are women, but not all women are wives. So those are necessary and sufficient conditions. And that's basically the big debate right now. Is dimethyl sulfide a dead ringer? Is it is it a, the the best biosignature that we have, like an index fossil or something, to indicate the presence of a certain life form? Can we use dimethyl sulfide reliably to say? that life is on the planet. And that's the big debate. We don't know if there's another way inorganically to produce dimethyl sulfide, especially earlier on in the history of the universe. So the other thing they point to here, and I'm going to pause it. So chlorofluorocarbons, that's mostly spewed out by, that's mostly just spewed out by factories. That's factory production. So full, um, fully or partially halogenated hydrocarbons that contain carbon, hydrogen, chlorine, fluorine, produces a volatile derivatives of methane, ethane, and propane. So this is a hydrocarbon that has been processed due to chemical reactions in manufacturing. So this combination, so this is technically an organic molecule, but its production is completely artificial. 
So finding these, again, it poses the question, could life create this a different way? Because there, there's carbon, hydrogen, chlorine, and uh, hydrogen, chlorine, and fluorine. These are kind of some of the most abundant elements in the universe. So it's it's difficult for me to sit here and say that there's no way that chlorofluorocarbons could have formed an organic. I mean, it's not even life forms that pro, uh, that produce chlorofluorocarbons. In fact, they're not even organically created in the first place. They're artificially created but not by actual life forms. So finding chlorofluorocarbons, that's mostly a thing to say like, oh, they're in a civilization stage and they're in factories. And honestly, it's more likely that the chlorofluorocarbons formed naturally uh, through some process in the early formation of the planet or perhaps by volcanism, rather than saying that these we're, we're appearing at a planet that's in its industrial revolution. The, the latter statement is just kind of just ridiculous and nonsensical, but dare to dream. It's all about kind of how skeptical, how skeptical are you? Because the data itself, I mean, it's there. We know dimethyl sulfide, we know chlorofluor, chlor, uh, chlorofluorocarbons are most likely there unless it's just um, a misinterpretation of data. But this is the stretch. It's a synthetic chemical. And I don't like the term synthetic. I, I don't know. Because it's like there's synthetic compound compared to a real compound. I prefer the term artificial, which just means that it's human made. But it's like synthetic leather versus real leather. I don't like just the term synthetic in general because it doesn't really have any scientific meaning. So that's just a, a, a nonsensical pet peeve of mine. But let me see. So there's a possibility, yeah, that it has a different chemistry or biology possibly seeded from life on earth, yada, yada, yada. Any hooser, I, I want to get to the part where he talks about it passing through the sun and such. So yeah, so they're looking at the spectra of this atmosphere. And there's d definite spikes. So it sees the amount of light blocked, which is the amount of light blocked by these compounds, uh, as because that's what they're measuring, they're measuring how much is um, actually making it back into the receptor of the telescope from this transit across the surface of the planet. And we know looking at the spectrum of light that is produced when this happens just by refraction, basically, we can kind of infer, okay, well, this compound we know mostly absorbs a certain frequency of light or refracts a certain frequency of light. And we can sort of determine based on how much light that it blocks, how much of it there is. And the actual wavelength of light itself is within this spectrum. So carbon dioxide mostly blocks a spectrum of light uh, between 200 and what I'd say, so this is 250, one, maybe 270 to like 280. And that's like carbon dioxide. And the amount, the percentage of light that's blocked, this is all beneath 31%, more around the 25 to 28% range that's going to indicate how much of the atmospheric composition is determined by this. And as you can see, there seems to be a decent amount of dimethyl sulfide in this atmosphere while being, while still about half that of CO2. I mean, that's still a decent amount of like huge amount of methane dimethyl sulfide and a very hefty amount of CO2. So it is possible like carbon dioxide and dimethyl sulfide in this spectrum, just because I don't know, maybe just because of the mix, but yeah, I, I like how they presented the data They're, They talk about how it's basically prismatic. You look at it like as it's moving across the planet, you can kind of tell. Yeah. So this is kind of what I wanted to show. So the telescope points at the distant object from one plane. So just as you're looking at your screen right now, this is how this telescope is looking at the planet. And here we go with the animation. All that light's bouncing off and they can tell on that bottom line how much light is being blocked by the planet itself. And so they can tell the time. They, they, um, they could basically tell the time when the planet is moving across the star and little tiny fluctuations at the rim indicate what the atmosphere is because the atmosphere is just basically a little tiny veil around the planet 
And so as it approaches the star, as it, as it transits be between the star and itself, you can basically pick it up. It like shimmers and that shimmer can determine composition. I don't know if that explains it, but that's basically what it is. It's really, really fascinating that the telescope's strong enough to do this stuff. And unlike, unlike the anamorphs of biology, I think that in some sense, the, the physicists that are actually serious about doing physics are doing incredible work because it's very easy to think that everyone in physics or biology or chemistry is just a mental masturbating idiot on Reddit. But in reality, the vast, I won't say the vast majority, I would say about 20%. I what is it like Zipf's flaw or no, no, no. It's the Pareto principle where literally 10% of scientists are doing 90% of the research. It genuinely is. It genuinely is such a state of affairs in science. And one could say like, oh, it's, this is a natural distribution. I disagree. I think the Pareto principle is a result of the corporatization of every layer of society. It's just bureaucrats, people with letters after their names that do nothing for anyone. They just kind of sit around and regurgitate the same crap into each other's mouths like a bunch of birds it's like two girls one cup but for for knowledge and science and it's just kind of a shame to watch it's like everything is recycled and just in one giant echo chamber and it's just a breath of fresh air to see actual scientists doing i mean even though it's northrop grumman that launches the the what is it the the, the newest space telescope the uh why well, i'm blank i can remember it's made by northrop grumman but James Webb. Yeah, they call it the James Webb. They should just call it the Northrop Grumman. I don't know why they call it the James Webb. It's like, I mean, thank the Iraq war for having this telescope. Thank you, George W. Bush, for, for finishing your daddy's war so we could have the James Webb Space Telescope. That's basically what I'm saying. So they could have non-biological origins, exponential challenges, limitations, but you have to be careful and cautious. And basically, at the end of this miraculous article, we have to we have to get real. So this is their oh, we're gonna get real part. So I like this. This is NASA space. So NASA space news. I gotta give it to NASA, even though they waste fifty five million dollars of taxpayer money every single day that 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 it exists and is a massive waste of money because it contracts out all of its missions. It provides okay astronauts but nothing that any private company couldn't hold to the same standard it is it is, i don't know how much money has been laundered through nasa and i know that i will hate on nasa a lot because they are still the government they're not beholden to anyone or anything but the higher ups that dictate everything for the rest of us so on one hand i think people who go into nasa just like the military have the best intentions but they're just mechanisms of a machine that secures America's power projections, not only on Earth, but into the rest of the universe. So I want to respect it. But at the same time, what will it mean for this life? For, so imagine we actually do end up being able to go there. And by that time, we're in Super America. Imagine we're in Super America and it's Halo Universe in 2000 if this is an equally advanced country and, and or equally advanced nation, and we've been mutually like we see each other at the, around the same time, we're moving towards this goal. Xenozoologists are in, in a place right now where their focus are, it, it's basically on microbes. I don't know what would happen if the can was blown open that not only relatively closely, I mean, relatively speaking, that there's, not only life, but perhaps life capable of industry of, why did I say it? Like in it's industry, industry, penultimate syllable. I think it's possible. I think it's, I think, I think the implications could be unsettling. Okay. So now that we've done something that actually has proof, let me go to the uh, polar opposite. So this is something, again, a lot of people have been pointing, everyone and their dog has been commenting on this. I think Kim Kardashian commented on this. Pretty sure Kevin Samuels ghost commented on this. I I think every single person like, like Mr. Beast. No, he didn't comment on that. But here we go. So Jamie Mouse San, a self a self proclaimed ufologist, you mean he didn't get his PhD in ufology? I am 
This guy's a fraud, man. Guy's a fraud. Guy's a fraud. Self-proclaimed. Like, this guy's genuinely disappointed that he doesn't have, like, a PhD in ufology. So, a ufologist and journalist whose coverage on aliens was one debunked. And this is like, did researchers find a mummified three-fingered alien in Nazca, Peru? False. See, this is Snopes, known for their debunkings. In spring of 2017, Gaia filmmakers joined researchers and scientists just outside Nazca, Peru, to investigate unearthed mummified body. Independent scientists and universities are currently analyzing findings with initial examinations suggesting a possibility of material that is unlike anything found on the fossil record. Wow. Wow. So what did they say? What? Real vintage photo of a giant Irish dog? That is not what I clicked on. This says... Okay. Once debunked, presenting two fossilized bodies, what he claimed were non-human corpses, to Mexican Congress on Tuesday, claiming researchers could prove with DNA testing the bodies were not of Earth, to the fascination of social media. So key facts. So this is the alleged. I, I think I think you could easily find it. Like I'm, I was sus from the very start. Not just because it's an alien, but because it just. I, it, it it just doesn't look like a mummy because it's like a mummy should look like like a mummy should look dark like hard tack like if you look at a real mummy like an actual mummy has dark skin it's like dark and leathery it's not like like we'll look at Peruvian. Peru mummy. Mummy. Peru mummy. <laughs> so it even like shows. So this is. So bro, this is this is one of the aliens. And why does it look like it's plaster? Like why does it look like it was made? So here are the actual aliens. I say actual with quotes. They look like E.T. aliens, like stereotypical E.T. aliens from like the movie E.T. But they don't look like mummies. Their skin is like chalky white. Like, why do the mummies look like they should be like pieces of jerky? They should look like the what is it? Chocolate. Spun Bob. I hate chocolate. I hate. Let me see what I get with that. I'll show you. This is what they're supposed to look like. I, I knew they would come through. This is what the alien mummy should look like. I'm gonna make this the thumbnail of my of this of this entire stream. The thumbnail of my stream is gonna be this. This is what these aliens should look like. They should not look chalky white. They they should not look like they were in, they were drawn in chalk zone. Why do the aliens not look like this? The aliens should look like shriveled beef jerky. They should look like they were they invented chocolate. Why do the aliens look why do the aliens look like this? No alien, no mummy on earth has white skin. Why does the alien why do the aliens have white skin? Real mummies don't have white skin. There's even real mummies in here. It's, so so here's another picture from another angle of, of the mummy. This is the other mummy that they said was a hoax. And so far, no, I've never really seen images, but it's, I don't know, there's head binding and all this, but it's like, look at the three long fingers. It looks kind of just ridiculous. It looks like it's covered in chicken skin. And then you look at a real mummy like this mummy. And look how black the skin is. Look how dark the skin of the mummy is. It looks like hard tack leather. It should be, it should look like one giant piece of leather. Because skin, when you expose it to the air, turns turns dark. It, when it desiccates and it dies, it turns black. Mummies, even though they preserve the soft tissue, they have dark, almost red skin. But both of these aliens have this chalky white skin. And you can't say, oh man, it, it's alien biology, bro. It's alien biology, dude. But these are clearly different species of alien. It's it's like if you look at the the other aliens if you look at these aliens the small aliens these guys 
clearly have the same sort of like they're clearly different from these other proposed mummies but they have the same chalky white skin they have the same weird chalky white skin and it doesn't make any sense they shouldn't have this chalky white skin they should have they should look exactly like uh exactly like this so i i don't know i don't know why why the aliens themselves that's basically what makes me so sus that's basically what makes me so sus i don't trust the actual mummification process of these aliens because actual mummies should look like this so i digress i already think it's a hoax i already knew it was a hoax basically from the moment i saw it i just didn't I, they just didn't look like actual mummified corpses they looked like props they look like somebody made it out of clay and was like oh this is a mummy like real mummies don't look like that dog real mummies don't look like that the small mummified corpses which had elongated heads three fingers and bodily makeup similar to hollywood depictions of aliens were allegedly found in peru in 2017 and were said by mouse to be about a thousand years old so even just because of dirt or decay or whatever it's these bodies should darken how, why are you just like a chalk white mummy? Why do you look like you're made of plaster of Paris? This thing looks fake as hell. Like there's no way it looks like, it looks like somebody got really creative with like an arm cast or something and made this. It looks, it literally looks like it's made of clay. Like this, this looks like leather. This looks like actual leather. This is like human leather, like dried human skin. And then there's this, it's, it literally looks like it's made of clay. It literally looks like somebody made this out of clay. It does not look like a, a corpse of anything. It looks completely crafted by someone. It does not look like mummies. Its face even looks like it was made with like clay or something. I don't buy it. It should look like this. <laughs> this should be more how it should look. Not like this. Or this. So what are the other key facts? Mao Sang claimed the bodies were found in algae mines that researchers at the Autonomous National University of Mexico claimed both finding one had eggs inside of them. So there's an x-ray with like an, with a, one with three eggs that suspiciously looked just like chicken eggs or something. Jose de Jesus Dalche Benitez, the director of Scientific Institute for Health in Mexican Navy, presented scans of the bodies. I, I reckon it's these scans. Scans of the bodies. Oh, man. Cuerpos no humanos de Nazca. So the non-human corpses of Nazca. Enigma and mystery. So this is a electron. Yeah. So they also said that the skull was like a llama skull flipped backwards. I think. Yeah, so they said that the, the so those eye sockets are too shallow. So one of the things about it is that the eye sockets of the skull are too shallow to actually house its eyes. So that was a that's that's a big part of it too. So these eye sockets are too shallow. So they're way way too shallow. There's no hole for an optic nerve, and it very much resembles the back of a llama's head. So those are things. It's like if it had because it clearly has like eyelids or whatever little squinty eyelids. But it has no hole because in your actual skull, you have holes for your optic nerves. There's no holes for the optic nerves. And as you look, even the jaw, there's no articulation for the jaw. So there's like a hole here where there should be a mouth. But there's no way to articulate the mouth. The mouth is basically a slit in this bone. There's no actual jaw structure. There's no malar. There's nothing. There's no lower mandible. There's just a mouth form. And the same with the nose. Like the actual structure of the nose is just two nostrils. It doesn't lead to any esophagus there's no respiratory structure that this leads to so just looking at the the skull alone none of it makes sense it immediately looks like a hoax when you even just analyze the skull so it, it's it's a bit much like unless the alien doesn't use an optic nerve and somehow some other way it's reaching the brain it doesn't have any way to reach the brain how is it doing this is it is it blind is it just a blind alien and it just has these big giant saucers in the front of its face for some reason it's difficult to say and then it's jaw like what is it does it have like a proboscis does it stick out its jaw and they have this like x-ray here but that's just a flat petition there's no esophagus as you can see it's just pure spine one two three four vertebra and there's no actual there's no actual esophagus there's no structures 
that go down this bony area. There's no, there's no throat, even a mummified corpse. You'd still be able to see where these, where these parts are again, no jaw. So it's, there's no jaw, but it, there's a mouth, like a tiny slit of a mouth and the super, super shallow. Yeah. So, and here we go. You see the brain, see where this is structured again, no, no hole for an optic nerve to connect to those eyes. Yeah. I, and no one I've seen has actually gone through and I'm using their own, I'm using their own presentation against them. That's something I've not seen somebody do. I've, I've, I haven't seen anyone so far critique their actual, their actual presentations yet. They just kind of do their own thing. And I think that's bias. Oh, what's up, Emmanuel? Wish I could stay longer. Oh, it's this. Oh yeah. No worries, bro. I'm glad you showed up. It's my hundred, my 100 sub Xeno zoology stream. So yeah, buddy, we're going in on this recent news. I'm debunking the, the Mexican alien head because as I'm pointing out right now, it doesn't have an optic nerve in its skull. I it's sockets are too shallow to actually have eyes and it just doesn't have a lower jaw or any teeth or mandible, whatever no structures to feed itself. And yet it has an eyes and a mouth on the actual specimen they present. So I'm going through the rest of this presentation and I'll just kind of explain they're, they're just spinning the skull in place. They made these 3d renders and scans. So in the chest we see, so we see arm bones, but I don't really think there's any scapula to be seen. So there's nothing that's actually really attaching the bones themselves to the rest of the skeleton. It seems like they're just free floating in their sockets. And some people point out the bones were backwards and stuff, but in the actual presentation, they based it off earlier scans, but in the actual presentations, the bones were not flipped. And so that's, that's a myth or that's not a myth that I think it was connected to, to an earlier presentation, but in this one, all the bones are actually the right way, but there's, there, there's still a nonsensical, uh, physiology. So with your, your shoulder, your humerus, what your shoulder is, is where your humerus connects to your scapula and is supported by your clavicle. So it, it seems to possess a clavicle as this weird bar, artificial bar. So it has this like hoop shaped uh, wishbone, but then turning around, I don't see a scapula where it connects to the rest of the skeleton. It seems that there's more meat and stuff. I see two almost protrusions of the latissimus or something, but there's, I, I don't see a place or scapula. I don't see any scapula where these, these humeri would actually attach. It seems that it articulates solely with the clavicle, which doesn't make any sense physiology, physiologically. So it's arms would essentially have no anchor point on the body to do anything with like you, you kind of need your scapula. Like you, your scapula is a connection point for a lot of the muscles that your shoulder needs to function and they don't have it. It just seems like they have a clavicle and they have these weird artificial structure in the chest. So these guys are saying in the, in this face of the eye sockets are of a large size, which allowed it for very broad vision. So he says it would, Oh, it's going to have broad vision. So this whole theory about it being blind is out, but he's claiming it has broad vision but the socket's too shallow to hold eyeballs and it doesn't have an optic nerve. There's no hole connecting to the brain that would, that would basically transmit that information. So this claim that he's making now doesn't make sense. This claim he's making now, they have broad vision. There's no way for the nerves to transmit the data to the skull unless they were using artificial eyes they had created. So he points out they have small nostrils So absence of teeth, mandibular joint, their feeding was by swallowing and not by chewing. The neck in turn, is, this is what he's saying, is a long structure that joins to the head. But if you look at the neck too, they're claiming, oh, well, this, this chamber might be the esophagus. Or so it's, it's sucking out fluid from this area to the, but again, there's no actual structures that allow it. There's no trachea preserved. There's no hyoid bone. There's no, there's no indication what's because they're so human like, right? But there's none of the indications, like even if it's just feeding by swallowing, the oral cavity is completely calcified. There's no ability for it to expand. 
so I guess that it's, it has to fill this up somewhere. So I guess it either takes on a little bit of food. It's, it's not impossible, but there's no trachea. There's no esophagus. There's no trachea. There's no indication that it's using this hole to feed or breathe. It just seems to be a hole in the skull. So they say there is a non-primate structure in the skull. Again, other people have speculated it's a, it's a llama skull or something. Through Alexander the Great, which is usually a circle of ovoid in shape, yada, yada. Being unique since in these species is rectangular and cubic in shape. Mixed harmony of the four or five, sir. So I don't know what his... So he's, he's presenting this almost as if it's 100% legit and he's just going down the line. But... Uh, this is to me kind of cringe because it's very clear to me that this this is fake. And as someone who's a career skeptic, whose whole shtick is being a contrarian on this platform, it wasn't hard for me to call this out as a hoax. Like I get very, very, very optimistic and excited for xenozoology and any developments in xenobiology. But this is one of those where I'm kind of just disappointed in humanity that people actually fall for this crap. I don't know, because one part here, like if I stop here, it looks like there's almost some sort of scapular structure. But again, the scapula is not the right shape to actually do anything with. The, the, this, this one little projection bone spur that doesn't exist on the other side either, I don't even think is a bone spur. Like maybe it's a bone something, but it's like, how are you supposed to articulate off that scapula? So now he's just counting... He's just counting the vertebra. And I don't know what he's doing. Oh, he's talking about the hands now. So the hand part, with the presence of millimeter eggs, this means who are continued process. So look at these hands too. Like these hands also have me sus. They don't look like they're very nimble. They look very big and meaty. It's like if they were hands meant specifically for grasping, like if they were on an animal, maybe I could believe it. But these are not the dainty hands of a creature that can rival a human's dexterity. Oh, wow. Nice, nice effects. Talking about oviduct. Okay, so here's some of the, the images we have. So this main image, this is the whole organism. So as you can see, no esophagus or trachea leading from the oral cavity. Its ribs are non-existent. So somehow it's supposed to be able to expand and contract its rib cage to breathe if it's breathing air. It doesn't seem to have that ability. It has these random eggs just sitting in the middle of its abdomen, which, okay, fair enough. But how are they supposed to pass through this tiny open? And then again, they have hips, but they don't have, or they, they have humerus. They have a humerus, but they don't have the adjoining hip architecture to anchor the humerus. They don't have a true hip joint. Neither do they have a true sh shoulder joint. They don't have a real, they have the clavicle. They have whatever this weird thing is in the middle that isn't organic. But then they also have a fully formed humerus, kind of like a human would have, but then none of the additional structures like the scapula that would anchor the humerus and be able to help it do stuff. It seems to only have one bone, one bone in the forearm. And that wouldn't allow it to pronate its hands. So we have two, two, well, the radius and ulna, but these two long bones, they can articulate around one another. So I can pronate my hands. So my hands default, default position would be if you relax your hand, it's like this. It's like to the side. I can pronate my hand downwards or the other way upwards. And because I have these long bones here able to articulate away, I can isolate my elbow joint and move my hand. I can pronate it downwards so that my hand from its neutral position, thumb up, can pronate down laterally so that it's parallel with the ground. That pronation is impossible if you just have one long bone in, in your forearm. So that alone has me sus. I mean, this is a fully advanced creature. And yet, as you can see, I guess 
Is that two bones super close together, basically fused? Again, the, the radius and ulna are not fused. If you look at the human bone, there's a space in there because that space has to exist for them to move past each other. You, you, it's not just enough to have two bones. You also have enough, have to have enough space for them to move past each other and pronate. And so even if this line, and so I see a line moving through both. I see rods moving through both arms. So I think that's just like a metal rod, which again, why is there a metal rod in an organic animal? And then this organic plate or inorganic plate, oh, that's kind of crossing the sternum, shows the head, shows the neck. And then there's the ribs are just these rings, which don't seem to be able to expand or contract. So they're comparing their skeletons to a human skeleton. And again, if you look at the human skeleton, look at the hips. L look at where the femur, the head of the femur connects to the pelvis. Look at the scapula. Look at where the shoulder joint of the human and the clavicle come together to support to support the humerus up here. And then I, I meant the head of the femur. I, I don't know if I misspoke. But the femur, the head of the femur connects to the pelvis. And the pelvis forms the socket for the femur to be attached to. And has a bunch of tendons and ligaments that anchor it, anchor the leg to that joint. And the same exists for the for the head of the humerus. It's anchored to all of these muscles, ligament, tend, tendons, and ligaments in the scapula and clavicle. And that's how we work. And then our ribs also have um, all kinds of like collagen. It has all of these elastic properties to it. And that also allows your ribs to expand and contract. And they're very complicated, very complex in their structure. You have a central sternum that is made of ossified bone, or I guess but all bone is ossified unless it's made out of um, cartilage, like at your joints and also part of your ribs too. These guys are completely unsophisticated rib cage. They don't have a radius or ulna. It seems to just be one single long bone, a very non-complicated wrist, no attachment points for its shoulders, or, and look, look how shallow, look how shallow and non-existent these attachment points to the hip are. I mean, it doesn't even have a real pelvis. It seems to just be a singular almost plate or girdle. And then there are these tinky, tinky, tiny femur heads that seem to be articulating with this very shallow plate-like socket of sorts. It just wouldn't work. Like There would be no ability for it to bear its weight. You see how pronounced and exaggerated the sockets of the hip are in a human and then compare it to these things. And you might say, oh, well, it needs to, it, it would be able to bear its weight. But keep in mind, it's also carrying all these artificial components. It'll be heavier in life. So in an organism, either it exists in gravity so low that it doesn't really have to do much to, to move around. Because again, it's not just about weight bearing, it's about articulation. Having a shallow hip socket means it's going to be continuously dislocating its hip. It, it, its range of motion will be extremely constricted because if, if it moves too far in one direction or the other, it'll dislocate its hips. It's like that SpongeBob. Again, we're going back to SpongeBob. It's like I have glass bones and paper skin. Every morning I break my arms and at night I break my legs. At night my heart attacks put me to sleep. Like it's basically that, but an alien form. So I am, I am very sus. This is their own presentation. This is straight from the horse's mouth. The guy speaking is Jose de Jesus uh, Benitez. And then they show the whole CT scan, which again confirms this time the, rod, the rod's confusing me. This time it does confirm that the rib structure is very simplistic, non-expanding ribs, and then a single long bone in the forearms. No scapula. And it doesn't go far enough for the, for the hips though. Let me, let me see what the stream is doing. I think that, uh, man, cause you, I don't know what you guys think, but I know for sure that looking at this myself, yeah, I don't buy it. I've made it no, no, note that they do not have carpal and tarsus bones. So these are very important. So your carpals, your carpals make up our bones in your wrist. And by not having carpals, not by and only having a radius and not an ulna, so having one long bone in the forearm, not having carpal bones, it's like they it's just metatarsal and that it's or metacarpal 
and that and phalanges. So there, it's like the the wrist won't be able to properly like you know that in order to write, you know that in order to type on buttons or type on a keyboard, you need wrist flexibility. Like how people get carpal tunnel syndrome because of how they have to articulate their wrist to use equipment. Can't fl even flint nap without wrist articulation. So not having the proper wrist articulation, like that's one of the ways that we can determine that early hominids, for example, were capable of perhaps manufacturing tools or being more complex is that we could, we could look at the brain size or brain architecture rather, but the biggest and one of the most important things is looking at the morphology of the hands, seeing if the, if these hominids were actually capable physically of doing these forms of manual dexterity, like homo naledi or homo habilis versus like an australopithecus or a chimpanzee. This is why I keep saying like, oh, australopithecus is this and that early homo. All that australopithecus is, is an upright chimp. It's just a chimp with more upright morphology. Like chimps can't already walk on their hind limbs. This chimp was just more developed than that. And that's why they don't put australopithecus in the genus homo. It is literally, it almost looks exactly like a chimpanzee with just more erect hip structure. And you could look at the hip structure and see this thing is based on the girdle of its hips, the ilium, ischium, and pubis, how they're arranged, and also where the hip joint is arranged and how long the long bones of the legs are in proportion to the rest of the body. You can determine that this animal, even though it still has a chimp-like height, has proportionally longer hind limbs or legs than, than a chimp and also seems to have adaptations to help it stand upright. Note, though, that the Australopithecus still has chimp-like feet. But again, it's, it's very interesting looking at these animals and trying to determine these traits. But when I apply these same standards to this alien, it's not even like, oh, it has this and this difference from humans, but it still has this and this adaptation. No, this is just straight up, seems to be a hodgepodge or chimera. It's what we call a chimera fossil. So it's not technically fossilized, but a chimera fossil in paleontology is an assemblage of different organisms made into a fossil. Like when the platypus specimen was sent back to I think the Natural Society in London from South Africa, they were like, this is a chimera fossil. This is clearly like a, a, a beaver tail on a duck. They were like, this is this is clearly a chimeric specimen. This is how I feel about this. Like maybe, maybe they these are what aliens look like. Maybe it's just horrifically disappointing. And they just kind of like clumsily, like they're like Muppets and they just clumsily like clack their hands on a keyboard or whatever to make things work. Or they have like voice to speak or they're telepathically using their eyes. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe they're just a skin. Maybe this is just a artificial frame and they're just a skin and they just schloff off like a slime girl and go into the next skin or something or maybe they're parasites or who knows who knows or maybe this guy's a schizo and should stick to posting on x or something but yeah so they say note they do not have carpal and tarsus bone so the tarsus is the heel bone by the way so it wouldn't even be able to walk so it has no tarsus bone to walk it has no carpal bones to manipulate objects and it also has one single long bone it ha in its arm, it doesn't have the right type of arm or leg morphology to either support weight by lifting it or by walking. This thing's a mess. It's like unless it solely exists for the vacuum of space. And it's pregnant somehow. So now we're getting a nice side view. Again, look at the hips. You have these virtually non-existent hips and they articulate at the bottom like these these hips are not supporting any sort of way. They can't articulate. Here's the pregnant part of it. Again, you can see the hip morphology here. Absolutely non-existent hip morphology. It's, it's like spine goes all the way down and then just ends like at the bottom of the organism, which is really bizarre. Because in humans, we have a coccyx, and the coccyx is not a vestigial tail like evolutionists say. It's an important support structure for muscles in your lower back and buttocks. And you need this. It's important for your ability to balance on your two feet. If you break your coccyx, it's painful, but severing or rupturing tendons, ligaments, or muscles in the coccyx can put you on your, literally put you on your ass for weeks. So it's a very important organ to have. And look at the iliac crest. Very extremely shallow iliac crest, which is not the end of the world. But again, this is all means that there's fewer muscle attachments for this for this organism. Yeah, this is this is not 
And now that they do the x-ray view of it, you can see even more poignantly and clearly, there is just is no actual hip bone to be found. There's no hips. There are no hips for these femurs to be attaching to. So it's like they're spo it's supposed to be pregnant with these three eggs, but has no ability to actually carry its weight. It's, it do I don't even, it doesn't look, it doesn't even look like it has a pubis bone. It just looks like an ilium and ischium, but it doesn't even have hip sockets. Also, I don't know when this changed to Spanish again. All right, so they use a communicate. Okay, so here's another good side view. So here's the mouth, supposed mouth. It's completely ossified. There's no mandible joint, no teeth. This goes down. There's no esophagus. This is just straight spine. So there's no esophagus that can transport the materials down. You go all the way down this seemingly robust spine, no real ribs to speak of. The ribs are just rings. Then you have eggs and then no, it doesn't seem like there's any uterus that they're contained inside. There's no sac. They're just eggs in a body cavity. And then you have non-existent hips. And I've dissected animals, guys. And let me tell you, there should be a lot more that you're seeing even in a mummy. Even if all these tissues are desiccated and small, you should still see the layers on the throat that delineate the, the esophagus and trachea, especially if it's so human-like. It, it, these are not things that are unique to humans. You, how is, how is the, the eye nerve connecting to the brain if there's no optic nerve cord, if there's, if there's no ability for it to have a window through the skull to that area? How is, how is food or water getting to the digestive tract or getting into the alien's body, period, if there's no connection from this oral cavity to the rest of the body, if it's just a dead end? There's no trachea, no esophagus, no nothing. Ribs can't expand arms and legs can't move without dislocating. It just stinks to me. So I, I respect the effort, the, uh, the amount of money poured into this, the amount of effort poured into this. I, I, I know they're trying their best to drum up, drum up attention for this, I guess, but nah, bro, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to vote these guys out. And they have these particle effects. I think the particle particle effects alone are well, I'm not going to believe these guys. Then they have the full 3D render. And again, just makes no sense. It's similar to bacteria uh, with a differentiation of around 15%. So because of this 30% difference from Earth-based organisms, that's the other gripe I have. If it's truly extraterrestrial, it should be basically zero. There's, it's, the majority of its genome is supposedly Terran in origin. They're like, oh, it's most similar to bacteria. Well, then it's still, that would still mean it's an Earth-based organism. 70% of its genome is similar to humans. And to keep in reference, we sure have our genome with a banana but why is an alien so closely related to human beings if this is an alien it shouldn't be related to bananas or humans we're so you're saying these aliens are closer to human beings than to bananas if that was the case then it should be considered a terran organism which is coincidentally what nasa's saying about the uaps but I'm about to get to that. So maybe, just maybe, maybe, just maybe, they've, th this is just like their final form. They've just been in space for ages and ages and ages, for thousands of years, and they've just anamorphed into this shape. I couldn't, okay. We'll, we'll say this, but now I want to go over to this NASA, what is it? NASA, NASA brief on, because this one had me, so you think after I said all that, that I'm going to go and just, oh, yes, there's no aliens. Then NASA has to come out. So I, I call out this, this Mexican alien hoax, right? But then NASA comes out and makes me feel, feel way, it, it, basically, I had to backtrack because I have never heard something so suspicious in my life. This is when I probably, this is like a four hour presentation. And I'm hoping that I can like fast forward to the highlights or something. 
But, but one of these guys says something very, very suspicious to me. And I really hope that we can get to certain points. But one of these guys says something very suspicious. And that's like, we know for sure these aliens are not. I think he said it right at the beginning. But they're like, we know for sure that these aliens are not going to be of uh, extraterrestrial origin. We know they're not of extraterrestrial origin. But then they can't explain where they actually came from. So the report UAP maps. So the UAP hotspots. They're talking about UAP hotspots. My, my stream is probably lagging because this is. I don't want to see the repeat of the top chats. But essentially, if you look at the UAP hotspots in this graph, you see that the UAP hotspots center around the American Southwest, the Atlantic coast. I think that's the West coast of Africa. Yeah. So the West coast of Africa, like around Ghana, then you have the Straits of Hormuz and much of the Middle East. And then you have East Asia. The greatest hotspots being, it looks like in the Rocky Mountains, uh, the south or the south of the, the coast off of maybe like Georgia or Maryland. Um, this looks like Iraq, interestingly enough. And then it looks like just right off the coast of Korea and Japan. So this is very interesting. The UAP hotspots, if you notice, mostly coincide with uh, outside of these outliers in the Pacific, like Hawaii and in uh, kind of like the, the Baltic areas and kind of Eastern Europe. Besides those areas, they seem to suspiciously fall on the same latitude. The same sort of subtropical latitude is where all of these hotspots are. It's like the subtropics have the most UFO reports. So the Northern Hemisphere subtropics, so like the Tropic of, what would be the, was that the Tropic of Capricorn? But it's like they're, they're concentrated on this tropic, which I find very strange. If I look up the Tropic of Capricorn, so, I, so that made me look up the Tropic of Capricorn, right? So where's the Tropic of Capricorn? Welcome to the rabbit hole. So the Tropic of Capricorn is in the Southern Hemisphere. That would make this one the Tropic of Cancer. Y'all following me? So here's the Tropic of Cancer. So the Tropic of Cancer is in the Northern Hemisphere. Look at that. So that's right in this line. And now we go back to this video on the reported UAP hotspots. And I'll blow this up. What do you notice about the reported UAP hotspots and the Tropic of Cancer? They're all concentrated along the Tropic of Cancer. They don't provide an explanation for this at any point in the video. I noticed this when I first watched it. In fact, it is a raw, this is one of the things I wanted to get to is the UAP reporting. I'm so glad I accidentally clicked on here. I think they even have a bigger map of it towards the front. But no, I'll stay here. So this is their map for the UAP reported hotspots. They never explain why the Tropic of Cancer is where all of these UFO reports on the entire planet occur. Why don't they occur in the population centers? It should be occurring mostly. Like, do you have it occurring here? Here? In the Middle East? In fact, just slightly above, just like within the, like above the Tropic of Cancer, but all along the 30th parallel. All along 30, 30 degrees of, what is it, longitude? It's latitude, longitude. But along our 30 degree mark, that's where you're getting all of these, all of these UFO sightings. Just north of the Tropic of Cancer. So the Tropic of Cancer, what is important? The constellation. Because Cancer is a crab. So the constellation of Cancer, and I'm going full tin hat on this one so this is the tropic of cancer this is the crab shape of the tropic of cancer what stars make up the tropic of cancer so origins of the tropics of cancer If I look at the origin of this, I'm about to, I'm, got, I'm, I'm about to blow your guys' minds. I don't think anyone on this entire platform has talked about this. 
this is, I mean, for maybe one of these days people will come through, but you heard it from me first. I am, you heard it from me first, guys. I think if there are aliens and these UAPs have an extraterrestrial origin, because NASA's like, we are confident that they're not of extraterrestrial origin. And then one of the questions points out, I'm like, okay, so they're not of extraterrestrial origin. So how can you say that they're not extraterrestrial? Because we said they're not extraterrestrial. And that's what I heard from the director. I mean, I, we can go to that point, but I want to point out this topic of cancer because they, they made me feel, that made me feel sus as a mofo. So interestingly enough, the aliens are concentrated around the Tropic of Cancer. They're concentrated around this point in the Earth's latitude, which is subtropical. And we have, what exactly the tropics of tropical zone? Let's see what this article says. But David, be clear. Nice little <laughs> fifth graders drawing, dude. Really t makes me want to take you legitimately. So the Tropic of Cancer, let's go down. So the Tropic of Cancer, oh, took me to Wikipedia. I don't want Wikipedia. Of course, Wikipedia immediately has the answer I'm looking for, but I, out of principle, don't want to go to Wikipedia. Tropic of Cancer explains. Oh, Encyclopedia Britannica, coming to save my day. So latitude approximately 23.27 degrees north of the terrestrial equator. This latitude corresponds to the northernmost declination of the sun's ecliptic to the celestial equator. And the ecliptic of the sun is a great circle that has apparent path of the sun along constellations in the course of the year. From another viewpoint, the projection of the celestial sphere in the orbit of the Earth around the sun. The constellations of the zodiac are arranged along this ecliptic. The ecliptic is inclined at 23.44 degrees to the plane of the celestial equator. This inclination is called the oblique of the ecliptic. The two points of intersection to the ecliptic and the plane mark the vernal and autumnal equinoxes. So the two points of intersection of the ecliptic and the plane mark the vernal and autumnal equinoxes. There is something about these UAP sightings and the need to be aligned with these far off constellations. So there's something, there's something about needing to be directly inclined to the constellations of these stars that, that correlates with UAP phenomenon. All of these UFOs, all of these UFO sightings all occur along or around this, this the Tropic of Cancer. They all are around places that are close to the ecliptic. The Northern Hemisphere, the Northern Hemisphere ecliptic is where all of these UFO sightings are happening. So as much as you want to be like as much as I want to be this really skeptical guy and be like, oh man, it, it doesn't make any sense. This is to me highly suspicious that, that the government, that NASA is coming out and saying, this is from 1996 to 2023. This is recent up until now. The typically reported UAP characteristics are around atypical orientation morphology, one to four meters in size, white silver translucent, and out and altitude of 10,000 to 30,000 feet, stationary to Mach 2 velocity, no thermal exhaust detected, intermittent X-band 18 to 12 gigahertz radar, radio 1 to 3 gigahertz to 8 to 12 gigahertz, intermittent short wave infrared, medium wave infrared thermal radiation. So they give radiation signatures, they have a certain appearance, and they have their preferences. The, high, the reported UAP altitudes are actually in the troposphere. They're below where most planes are flying, but not so close to the ground that most people would be able to. So they, they have this interesting spike, this very interesting spike. Um, so they're not really being detected at high altitudes, but they're also not being detected at, at the altitude where most planes fly. They seem to be flying lower than that. And we know from the Pentagon and we know from the military that these type of spheres from Brazil to America, like, again, like, look at Brazil. I mean, we do have some stuff from South America, but look at where all of these reported phenomenon are. Is that not a coincidence? Why are they all concentrated around the Tropic of Cancer? I don't get it. 
I mean, one of the only places outside, and like I, I point all these out, but one of the places that they seem to have a lot of it is Hawaii. And then they have another hotspot. I think that's in, I think that's Guam. But if you look at the Tropic, like Hawaii is just south of the Tropic of Cancer. Hawaii is also one that has one of the least amounts of light pollution anywhere on the planet. And interestingly enough, it's one of the few places in the Pacific whatsoever that you're getting UAP UAP reports. They're so like, oh well, it's it's Pearl Harbor. It's the it's the military base. Uh, it is. I mean, maybe it's it could be government tests. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But they're basically admitting that these are unidentified. That they're not American. That they're not of Earth origin, or at least they're not of they're not of extraterrestrial origin. But they're not made by any recognized government. And that's where I think a lot of them are. are, are it's either tests of Northrop Grumman, like if you're to believe Stephen Greer who believes there's like 18 different types of aliens and that Northrop Grumman is responsible for most of these UAVs, then maybe. And we'll, I'll cover Stephen Greer uh, in a bit. But now they're talking, I took off the subtitles. I want to go back to this graph. So here's UAP reporting trends. So this is a public meeting on these phenomenon. I want to see... There's another one I wanted to show you. There's another video. So uh, NASA briefing on UFOs. So this is the, is, is it this guy? Who is it? Okay, it's this guy. This guy is the one who said that they're not of, so they're, they're, there's no evidence that they're of alien origin, but then also claims that he has no idea where they come from. So they're definitely not aliens, trust me, bro, is basically his response. They're not aliens, trust me, bro. So this geezer, even though I just explained the Tropic of Cap Capricorn coincidence and the fact that all of these UAP sightings seem to happen along the Tropic of Capricorn, which is on the Earth's northern hemisphere ecliptic to view these constellations directly, even though that, that there's this massive correlation between its location in the third in the in thir at 30 degrees or at the tropic itself like in Hawaii nope we're we're going to throw we're going to throw out this whole trend this coincidence that you can clearly see from the data and instead I'm going to I'm going to hit you with these red hot facts they're definitely not from earth definitely definitely not from earth but <laughs> or they definitely are maybe not a, he didn't come out with anything conclusive and that's one of the things that really irritated me about this post briefing is that they're going to make a brand new department. I'm just going to give you all the rundown. Like I just want to bring up the video, but it's like, they give you the whole, they give you this whole thing where they're going to make a new department. They don't announce their department head because they say he's going to be harassed. And they're just being super secretive about how they're going to handle this. They, they, this guy definitely says they're not aliens, bro. Trust me. But then also admits that these UIPs do not belong to any known nation. So they're just running down these people. I want to get to the questions. I think honestly, it was like that first question uh, that the sum underlined the word sum 10 times. Non-human intelligence. What's the plan to disclose that to the public? So what's the plan to disclose this information to the public, these non-human intelligences? Are these non-human intelligence legit? And NASA is basically saying yes, but we but they're not aliens. We have no proof they're of, of extraterrestrial origin. And it's like, then what other theory are you working with, guy? Like, I want to I want to get to the question where he specifically says it, but now we're actually in the questions themselves. So, I mean, I could ca I can camp this unless someone has a suggestion, but I, I'm trying to find the exact part where he says this. The one thing I kind of one thing I kind of looked back on. Because even though I don't think the Nazca aliens are legit, I mean, these things are flying around now, man. Like, that's 1993 to 2023 we're looking at. This is a 30-year period where we're seeing these aliens. And, oh, man, it's like this guy's doing exactly what I'm doing. This guy's just saying a bunch of stuff to fill the dead air. 
So the American government, he's, it's like, ask him, is the American government open? It's like, yeah, we're open. We're open, guys. We're totally going to be open. We're open as fees. We're, we're super open. We're, we're the most openest open people ever. When has the government never been open, bro? We're not going to tell you the name of the person, this new department that we're spearheading or what the department's actually going to be doing, what powers they're going to have or what liberties they're going to take. But we're open, bro. We're just super open. So what... Again, they're not calling it UFOs because UFOs have such a strong connotation. They're using UAPs, unidentified anomalous phenomenon. So I know, I mean, they're trying really hard to make it seem as neutral spot, but there's no way you're going to create a three-letter alphabet name for this and not still make people think. So he, he believes that there's potential for aliens in the universe. And he thinks that the only way that they could uh, cross these great distances is if they were super advanced and yada, yada. But it's like, these are, these are crafts that are leaving no trace signatures. They're moving from stationary to Mach 2. They can seemingly go into water without taking damage. And like, they seem to be sufficiently advanced. And all this is making me think is that either they're literally demons or something, or there's something more to this. So you pointed out a direction of UAP research. Have you named someone that role and what kind of investment are you considering making in this going to a new program office? So I might just, I might just cover this whole thing because a lot of these questions are actually really good. So once more, they flounder. They don't really have a concise answer for them. And they're not okay, basically the gist of this. So they're going to talk for like another 10 minutes. And basically what they're saying is, I'm not going to tell you the name. They're, what it basically is going to be is like, I'm not going to tell you uh, what... <laughs> who the actual guys in this department is or what this department's really going to do. So before anyone gets disappointed about this NASA panel, they're not going to tell you. They're just, they're just not. So Dan Rivers from British Broadcast IC News. I don't know why. <laughs> I heard the word Stigman mentioned several times and when I'm Stigman, your message to pilots and other people that this is no longer the preserve of the cranks. They want to be laughed at and that you would take them seriously. Is that the takeaway? Yes, that's exactly the message. I mean it now, so... So they're just saying, like, you know, bring me your huddled masses, whatever. Like, if you're a pilot, no one's going to call you a schizo. No one's going to tell you to take your meds. No one's going to call you an, uh, a far-right conspiracy theorist if you, if you want to come forward and say that you saw something. But they're definitely not aliens. If you say that they're aliens, you're a bigot or something. I don't know. I don't know. The... The, the, this entire meeting feels so contradictory because they're not saying that we're not saying that it's aliens. It's just that no government on earth. I'm like the term alien, the term Xenos, these things just mean foreign. Alien just means foreign. It doesn't matter if it's a foreign species or from earth, not from earth. It's, we don't know who made these things. And if it's as easy as, oh, it was Northrop Grumman testing crap. That's the one thing that with, for example, Stephen Greer, again, even if Northrop Grumman had like these gravity manipulating machines, I, don't, I just don't think they're going to stay secret. I don't think they're going to stay secret. Can you talk to that by pointing down? I mean, we looked at that as one example, and you know what I think? This is something, um, I don't know what this guy's question is. I'm not going to skip these questions because, I mean, we're already halfway through the video. I might as well just cover it for the next, like, I don't know how much is left. Why is this guy just talking, bro? Yeah, we have like half an hour left. And I'm pretty sure I have this mofo on 1.25 speed. Yeah, look at a final needle in the haystack. You've got two choices. Okay, I'm going to skip to the next person. When we study anomalies and assets in space, our other areas of science we're trying to do is bring this approach to this field by saying collect high quality data, understand normal events, and that's how we move things forward. Thank you. Oh, she's a baddie. Oh, she has a really nice sounding voice. Oh, yeah, she's she's based. She's based. She's like, oh, most people just use UFOs. Like, why are you still? Why are you changing the name? Like, why are you not calling them UFOs? Because everyone knows it as UFOs. 
So he, now they're saying AI is a very essential tool for identifying rare occurrences yesterday. But this big AI summit, we had um, senators meeting tech tycoons. I, I was also going to cover that, but. Yeah, so she's based in and probably extremely blue pilled, but, you know, I, I give credit where credit's due. So. So he believes that AI needs to have boundaries to be regulated. The big question is, is that if this is a highly intel advanced and intelligent race of aliens, are we going to trust AI to be doing the, the fine calculus and all this? I'm not, I don't know why AI seems to be so necessary. Like artificial intelligence is good when you want to automate a task without direct oversight. AI is good when you want to test something multiple times in a thousand different iterations and have it turn out somewhat accurate. It's like AI is good for many, many things. It has a lot of different applications and, and uses where if, if something's simple enough to be delegated to a machine that can learn the task, iterate on the task and self-improve, that doesn't require as much constant development, patching, et cetera. Like a, a machine or some code that can debug itself would, would save tech companies thousands of dollars and probably ruin the careers of many, many people. But that's the kind of stuff AI is good for. Analyzing data and presenting it, regurgitating it back, and not it's like chat GPT. Like if you if you give AI like court cases and tell them to, uh, if you give them a basic court file, like they'll make up court cases. They'll, they'll just make them up. They, they won't be right. And modern AI requires so much direct oversight. It literally is like trying to take a, a really intelligent, vastly intelligent toddler and just giving it a task. It doesn't have any nuance. It just kind of, when it iterates and does what it wants, it's a, it's a random process. We don't understand how machines learn. We set up the parameters for, for machine learning, but however it learns, it's going to learn. And we can fine tweak things, but I'm not going to trust any data that's just churned out by AI just because people want to save on hiring a decent physicist. Like, please get someone to actually do the numbers, NASA. The last thing I want is to get this big, huge report and it's made by, by NVIDIA's AI bot or something. Like, can you please just hire somebody? You have, you're have you costing the taxpayer 55 million effing dollars every single day. You can't hire one one physicist. You, you can't outbid one university to find a, fit or a, a team of physicists that can do these calculations for you. You have to use some shitty AI. So like, again, there's, there's many things about this panel that really royally pissed me off. This is one of them, like their use of AI it's just like, it's just a meme. It's like this big thing. They're just trying to force AI down our throats. An automobile or a, a train or a shotgun, like, damn, those things came out and it was, it was hot. People were like, oh, a vacuum cleaner. Hell yeah. I love not having to sweep the floor with a broom. But like, this is like, oh guys, we have AI. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to steal your job so we don't have to pay you as much. Like, I honestly, at this point, AI is so dangerous. It's more dangerous than a nuclear weapon because AI, if it ever became malicious, could hack a nuclear weapon. Like Korean North, North Korean children in their basement hacked hack the Pentagon for like their 13th science fair project. For, it, it's, it's not something where I'm comfortable sitting down and being like, okay, I'm going to let this rogue AI have access to all of this detailed government information. That surely won't go wrong whatsoever, guys. And this director, this this like boomer dude, simple trolling. Some of them actually rose to actual threats. I'm like, you're the government. You're the government. Like if people, it's like, oh, we received, we can't be transparent because we received vague threats, but never specified if we actually received threats. I'm like, this is something people do all the time. They make allegations that they're being threatened with death. I'm like, okay, do you have any proof that you're being threatened with death? Is there any letters? They could bring up right now. I mean, those seem like serious allegations to be threatening a government official with death. That seems like something you would probably end up getting charged for, right? But he just says, oh, some of them got death threats, but never said by whom or when they happened. They, he just makes this flagrant allegation to hand wave away being transparent about who's actually going to be leading this. And seeing the kind of hires that the Biden administration has made recently, I want to know if some deceptic, I don't want Decepticons in charge of aliens. If, if our alien relations are reliant on Decepticons, like what Biden did with Ukraine, I don't want a transformer going out there and making a fool of humanity.
I don't I don't want aliens to think that every single man is like, oh, well, well, Glee Glorp, it seems that these human males are, are very similar to females in their lengths and proclivities. No, I don't want that. I don't want an alien to ask why I don't wear lipstick and high heels just because I'm a male. I, you don't don't confuse the aliens, man. Anyway, I think that the main thing that this this is basically telling me. The likelihood of there being extraterrestrial explainings or being uh, scientific explained for many of these phenomena is very, very small. Shouldn't NASA devote its research budgets and its efforts to those much more likely and tangible uh, signs of extraterrestrial life through things like the, J um, the James Webb Space Telescope or extraterrestrial planet, whatever. So I thank you for the question. So yes, obviously we don't discuss budget openly, um, but we are committed to supporting the whole of government. Study into UAP and all of our data is open. You could just tell by the way they speak that they're like, oh, we're transparent, we're transparent. We, we have all of our data, but we're not going to talk about it. Oh, no, we're transparent, we're transparent. We, all, we have all of our data, but we're not going to say who the head of this new department is. Oh, no, we're transparent, we're super transparent. Oh, but we're, we're not going to tell you actually what we think that the origin of these things are. It is just, it's, it's almost like they cry out in pain as they strike you. It's, it's basically this process of them talking about how transparent they are and then just just saying doing the complete opposite it's like they're, they're completely opaque they're like oh guys we're transparent we're transparent and you're just not transparent it, it's like these girls who literally all day complain like every single val valentine's day will boohoo cry like play lincoln park montages and then talk about how they're bad all by themselves like it, it is literally that but for for a government agency it is so cringe to watch these guys sit here and be like we're transparent, but we're not going to say how much money we're putting into this. We're transparent, but uh, we're not going to tell you who's actually the head of this. We're transparent, but uh, we're not going to tell you what we actually think the origins of these things are. Right, right, right. So she is just talking out of her ass right now and deflecting the question. So it is a bit cringe. Is she just, is she still, is she going to be talking for like the next five minutes? Holy crap. It's allegedly two non-human corpses. What of any importance? Yada, yada. Do you attach to these? So these, this guy talked about the, the Mexican aliens and this, this guy said it was a, was a hoax. So we're going to, I'm going to see their takes. So we have unusual things. You want to make data public. I think of this as like NASA has one of the most valuable samples the response, what do we do? What do you make them available to any of the scientists? So if he said, if I was a Mexican girl, I'd make, be making recommendation uh, not to change. Yeah, so he said, make the samples public. Like, this is one of the main goals that we're trying to do here today is to move conjecture and conspiracy towards science and sanity. So it's like, it's data, guys. We're, we're using data. And again, they contradict themselves because they're talking all about like the data, my data. But they won't tell, they, they won't tell us, oh, is Brady. Nah, she's she's not as cute as a British girl. Not as cute as a British girl. How, how's her voice? Again, but she has a very pleasant voice. So they're talking about Arrow. So again, honestly i'm very sick of the chuds that they got to come up here like i think that guy from Reuters is the only guy who actually asked a decent question everyone else just kind of just like oh what about the mexican aliens i'm just like dude you you waited you waited 30 minutes or an hour or two hours you stood in line and spent time you you, you literally just put in all that effort to ask them about the Mexican aliens? Like, honestly, I just don't even know. I noticed a lot of the... So, she points out that a lot of the data and images are from the, de the Department of Defense. 
Oh, and she's pointing out how they don't come from other agencies beyond the DOD. Like it's only all. So they're talking about. So again, I'm going to pause it real quick. They're talking about transparency of data. Like if you want people to, to believe it, then make your data public. But NASA makes its data public. But then <laughs> the only data it provides to the public is from the DOD. So they immediately like this is one thing I noticed. And this is why for some reason these like decently attractive, like even though they, even though they're fun but on the wall like these aren't too bad looking women like they're the only ones that actually came there with decent questions because this immediately caught them with their pants down like you can see the looks on these people's faces like <laughs> immediately they're like immediately they're just sheepish because they just talked about being super transparent and yet she very correctly pointed out like oh this there's all this other data and footage that does exist but it's not being made public it's only seemingly this dod stuff so like are they going to make that data public so it, it's just like a pants down question just started like just started just got done criticizing the mexican government for not being or these people who came forward like i said that journalist about their data not being public about their samples not being public but then they're not being public with all the data about these aliens man so this nasa panel had me going from oh these aliens are i was i was i came to it so skeptical but then like nasa had to come out and make me completely sus make me completely rethink the whole thing now i'm thinking like okay even if the nasca aliens aren't legit and they're not we definitely know that these aliens like they are they are literally juggling either this is one massive psyop to distract people from from biden getting accused of sexual assault or something or hunter biden's whatever whether it's not a deflection from any of that i don't know but maybe it is I, I, I just but it's nasa it's like this is what nasa does like why is nasa doing this like if it was the white house coming out and, and juggling apples then sure i would probably believe that it's just a psyop or distraction but it's not the white house it's nasa coming forward with this is i guess oh is nasa trying to stay relevant why would nasa need to stay relevant i mean they're, they're so they're already trying to go to mars with spacex maybe this is trying to drum up enthusiasm for space maybe nasa is doing this as a as a as for an attention grab but it's clearly not because we have confirmed a lot of this footage which coming out of the dod we have people blowing whistles this is an actual happening this is not a nothing burger people really want to dismiss this and i think that they're they're right to be skeptical but i mean these are people remember guys these are people who are evolutionists they believe life appeared on this earth randomly through random processes that that inorganic part or that organic and inorganic particles assembled themselves, deassembled themselves and reassembled themselves into life forms within just like a, a snap of the cosmic fingers. Like what was it Jim Henson that said, give me one miracle and I can explain the rest. The idea that non-life can be get life is completely non-scientific. And I've, I've pounded into your heads a thousand times now by the Louis Pasteur experiments, but it's like these people, people who walk around thinking that they're gods of the, of the earth, that they're self-proclaimed, just ultimate peak life forms and that there's no greater power than them and that they're the most intelligent beings on earth and most spiritual beings on earth and they just live this life of hubris they can't stand fathom shake or swallow the idea that there might be powers greater than them they can't, they don't they're uncomfortable with the idea of a god they don't believe in higher powers in the universe they don't believe in demons they don't believe in uh, paranormal phenomenon they live their lives completely empirically they they what they see is what they believe and they just live in a cave of of illusion it's literally plato's cave because all they see are the projections on the wall they only trust their eyes they only trust their ears but it's like they've never seen an optical illusion you you take that mindset into an illusion gallery into a playhouse it's like dude you you take that attitude when you drop acid or something and you're going to quickly realize that wow your eyes and your ears and your senses can deceive you man Every time you see a monster under the bed, it's like people blindly trust their senses. They, they admit that observation can manipulate data on a quantum level. Like, why does the Heisenberg uncertainty principle exist? Why can you know the position of an object? How can you know the, the momentum of, of an object that small? But you can't know both. I, I, can, I can know one thing about this particle in space, but by observing it, I change it. My observation makes the data probabilistically either end up with one outcome or the other. So a lot of the universe exists in this state of suspended probability. And only when I directly observe it, does it change? That seems to imply that human observation, something with the way we sense and observe the universe, something about consciousness 
intrinsically impacts the universe around it. But again, these people don't want that implication. They don't want to admit there might be things bigger than what's going on underneath the surface. So what we have is a lot of people correctly pointing out, oh yeah, well, uh, I think there's, oh, we have, we have all these questions and da -da 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 they don't want to come out and say the, the, the serious things about UAPs because they're just, we're working closely with Arrow, we're working closely with Arrow. Everything is hush hush. I feel like if anything, they're, ha they're being forced to respond about these things because of how much public, how much public hype has been generated around it. So on one hand, I can't blame him for doing this. This doesn't seem like a psyop. If anything, this finally seems like something that should have been covered decades ago is finally being covered now. So they're not transparent about, uh, about Arrow. They're just not open about who's going to be spearheading this new department. And they're talking about security. It's like, okay, well, if these are UAPs, what, what do you mean security? Why is it a security risk to share UAP footage? They're not aligned to any government. So what are you trying to avoid the... It's Okay, so if, it, if it is just private companies testing crap, they just come out and say it. They come out and say, okay, Northrop Grumman is testing highly advanced engines and technology. Who would care? North, North, it's like the, these are companies that can already build machines that can go Mach 7 and fly in the upper atmosphere and sh and drop a bomb that can be that's guided by some dude in Serenado that can hit somebody crapping on the toilet at, at like 10,000 feet and only blow him up and cause no collateral damage. Like th these are companies that already basically have space age technology. And I'm supposed to believe that if they are private companies, if they are nation states, this is not something like the American public wants to know. Like, where did these things come from? And by saying like, we need, we're trying to, to protect national security, like pulling out the national security card. What are you afraid of? What, what are you afraid of the public knowing about these things? It's like, oh, aliens exist. It's like, we're already at the point where people are so skeptical about this, where they already probably do think aliens exist. And I honestly, if anything's a side, it's a stupid Mexican alien thing. It's like these idiots are just, I feel like these idiots are like the paid chills that just go in and derail like a legitimate phenomenon. They're trying to make it seem like a big joke by perpetuating a hoax or just trying to get rich off the phenomenon. But nobody cares about what they have to say. They're talking about a thousand year old alien mummies. This is right now. These are from UAPs that were verified and reported from multiple locations around the Tropic of Cancer. So one thing I know for sure is that there is something a lot about this that it's like, again, NASA's, you were here to bring openness and transparency. NASA makes measurements all across, da, 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 open and available, all of its data, but will not actually release most of the footage that they have. They will not actually make transparent much of what they have. And then again, so they're like, oh, the liaison. We want to know. It's like they talk about a transparent and transparent there, and then watch. Doesn't answer her question. Doesn't answer her question about the about the liaison between NASA. It's like they talk about openness. We're open with our data. We're open and transparent. We give out our data, but then won't answer things like how much of the NASA budget is going to Arrow. Who's in charge of Arrow? Who's the liaison between them and Arrow? Who's the liaison between Arrow, the DOD, other departments? They won't answer a single one of those questions whatsoever. They are non-transparent about the actual structure and organization and relationship between Arrow, NASA, and the Department of Defense. So why are, it's like, if, if this is the case, then why are you sitting here talking about openness? If you won't answer the most basic fundamental questions that these people have, that everybody wants to know, these are mainstream media press conference people. There's nobody from Breitbart waiting in that line. These are all MSM shills. All of them probably voted for Biden and for porous borders and all that. These are not like right wing radical conspiracy theorists from 4chan. These are mainstream media journalists. And they won't even be transparent with them. They won't even answer those basic questions. And yet 
are this entire interview. How many times? I if I want to get like a word cloud, I want to take a shot every time they say the word transparent. If I did that, I would end up in the hospital. My blood alcohol volume would be so high, you could probably drink shots of my blood and get yourself equally lit. I think at this point, this entire presentation is just a joke because they're so adamant about dismissing the extraterrestrial origins of these things. So adamant about saying how transparent they are and yet won't won't actually do anything that actually gives them any data. Yeah, you said, so this guy says, you said that NASA would be transparent, but a month and a half ago, David Grush said under oath in Congress that the US government is in possession of UAPs and extraterrestrial life. How can you be sure at NASA that other parts of the US government is being transparent as well? He's like, I don't speak for other parts of government, but I can tell you that NASA, which I do speak for, is open and transparent. Again, take a shot. With our data, do you believe what Mr. David Grush said, or is he lying? So he wants him to give a personal opinion. <laughs> so he's going to claim now that what David Grush testified under oath about was just hearsay. So even though David Grush was a... <laughs> literally in charge of this program in the cia like he's like i had a friend i'm like david grush is legit he was a it's a high-ranking member in the cia like what it, let, let's just look up david grush's credential so david grush don't even don't even take it from me let's look up what so he said he he heard it from a friend so who is david grush So who is David Grush? Like this, this guy's David Grush. Doesn't give his qualifications. David Grush is interview. David Grush. David Grush, 36, is a U.S. Air Force veteran intelligence officer and UFO whistleblower who's accusing, uh, accusing the government of possessing intact and partially intact craft of non-human origin. So here's confirmed footage. And again, a lot of this UIP footage is confirmed by the Department of Defense. Debrief first broke of our Russia's accusation June 5th of 2023. So Air Force veteran, intelligence official, and US UFO whistleblower. So he said, Grush has accused the government of illegally withholding the information from Congress. He filed a complaint alleging that he had suffered illegal retaliation for his conf uh, confidential disclosures. The outlet also reported that he has obtained similar uh, corrobor corroborating information from other intelligence officials, both active and retired, with knowledge of these programs. This NASA douchebag comes out here and hand waves out. It's like, oh, it's just hearsay. He said it from a friend. That friend is someone else also in government that backed up what he said. This dude, David Grush, is not some who, like he's not like me, some whoologist. He's actually in this, he was actually working in and around programs that dealt with UFOs and UAPs. He was in the CIA. He he was he he was connected enough to know other people that also backed up his story. It's not like I he said this and his friend said that. It's like no, he has the claims. Other people backed him and supported him with these claims. This is part of the reason why this entire thing is blown up in the first place. It seems like NASA is having this meeting not actually to perpetuate the idea of, of aliens, UFO, whatever. They're trying to like shove it under the rug. They're like, oh, we're going to make a task force, going to make this, and we're going to make that for it. And uh, and yeah. But NASA is basically fronting for all these other agencies that won't disclose this information. The Department of Defense is working with NASA to basically run shield for this because now David Grush has blown the whole lid off, off this whole thing. This isn't like Stephen Greer coming out and being like, okay, Stephen Greer, he is, you know, he's a an heir to the North Grumman estate by like eight, like three generations removed or something like his, he's a nephew of the person who's the heir of North Grumman. So it's like, who cares? <laughs> like, okay, he's a doctor. I think I actually do like Stephen Greer, but he doesn't have the connections. Again, D Stephen Greer is, he said, she said, Grush is right in it. Grush is like in the thick of this. And they, this guy hand waves away Grush and all the other whistleblowers in, in the CIA and in the intelligence community that worked with UAPs and UFOs. And just acts like my personal opinion, this guy's full of it. So he said he interviewed 40, 40 different people in the Pentagon. So Grush interviewed 40 people in the Pentagon to give their statements about this confidentially. And he claims he faced illegal retaliation for it. That prompted 
the the wider congressional interview. So for those that don't have the context, he's like, just the facts, just the facts, just the facts. But he won't even give us the facts. He's like, we just want facts. We want facts. And yet you won't tell the people the budget that, that that's going to cost with this collaboration with Arrow. You won't tell anybody if other agencies have undisclosed data about UAPs. You won't even say affirmative or negative. You won't even say yes or no if there's undisclosed information about UAPs that other government agencies might possess. Or if you've actually classified everything. You claim that it's national security. You won't talk about budgets. You won't you won't say how much this is actually costing the American taxpayer who's paying for this. Imagine paying for a service and then having somebody have the a mitigated goal, have the balls to tell you, oh yeah, you don't need to know where this money's going. It's like if you pay taxes, you're just dumb. Like I feel like we're at the point in American history where it's like if you're paying taxes to this modern administration, you're just an idiot. Because how in the hell Am I supposed to be confident with paying my taxes when you won't even tell me what my tax money is going to? Again, NASA costs the American taxpayer $55 million every single day. You could create 55 millionaires every single day in America if you got rid of NASA. Can you – like that is insanity to me. That is insanity. How much it costs America is insane. I mean not as much as the Ukraine war by a decent margin but still. It's, it's mind boggling to think about the fact that they literally are sitting here, their entire fortune, all of these people you see are no different than any career politician. It's like, it's like people who come to come to me and they're like, have worked for the military, they're glowies or they were, it's like they work for the state. If you work for the government, you work for the state, bruh, your entire paycheck comes from the taxpayer. I don't want to talk about like, oh, leeches, this and that from these kind of people. It's like these type of people think that, oh man, these sleazy journalists coming up and asking me these hard hitting questions. I just want the facts. And yet when in typical po politician fashion, they are not transparent with their own data. And then they take the phones and each person on the phone is just cringe. Like this, this next person you can hear like the entire, we're not, we're not going to get anything out of this next call. Cause I'm pretty sure this is the call where like somebody was like breastfeeding their baby in the background or something like it's, like, I, I don't know, bro. I don't know. Th this one is not. Why limit us in anything? What is he saying? Oh, so now now's the other one about AI. In all areas, to be explored in all areas. So that, that even means in defensive applications. That means in espionage applications. It needs to be explored in all areas. Guys, you got to live. One thing I've learned about politicians, you got to dissect their words sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase. I know that guys like memology already do this stuff, but it's just like, it's just like when people say like, oh, don't listen to what women say, listen to what they do. I disagree. I highly disagree with this statement because women will always tell on themselves. Criminals will always tell on themselves. Like if, if people, people run their mouths and say things subliminally that they don't even intend to say. They say a certain thing or a certain phrase, and they don't even mean. They don't even mean to say it. They, they say the quiet part out loud. If you get them talking, they'll eventually do it. And that's like that's such a powerful thing. And so they're talking about applying AI to everything and anywhere. And so very eager to implement AI Yeah, so they're basically defending AI, their use of AI and everything. But yeah, the rest of this meeting, commercial contracts, reporting of sightings, and also I think that's when you talk a lot about the importance of censor. A lot of this is fluff. So the, the last parts of this interview are nothing that I would personally shake a stick at. But I, I hope that you guys can kind of see right now how much NASA is bullshitting the public when it comes to these things. I hope my, I, I hope this, this, what is that? What is that? Uh, that doge meme where it's like, Lord help me as I like, Lord, give me strength as I try to navigate this left wing meme. Like that was basically me with this whole panel. Like I just sat here completely. I watched it live. I watched this thing live and I was so salty. I, wait, I actually, I think I missed it by like two hours. I, I don't think I, but I definitely watched like the, that other panel they had live. 
but this was so painful to get through. I'm just sitting there raging at the machine. All this talk about transparency and they are not transparent. So even if the, the Mexican aliens are a hoax, this NASA thing, like these UAPs, these recent spots, like I'm going to go to the Tropic of Cancer and where is this planet? So I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk about that original video. So where is this thing? This planet was... Okay, okay, hear me out. So the Tropic of Cancer, that that's in order to observe the constellations. I want to see where this planet is at. So JWST K1218b. So K218b... I'm going, I'm, I'm keep, I'm going down this rabbit hole. So 124 light years from earth. Keep this in mind. 324 light years from earth. So here's the exoplanets website from NASA. And this is the one I show I, I've gone to a lot in my other xenozoology per periods. So it's not too large. It's a super Earth. Rocky world potentially potentially larger than Earth. This one has it like weird colored, but I think maybe because of the dimethyl sulfide. But if we look at the system, this entire system, 18B is not considered in the habitable zone, but it is over here. And that's because of how elliptical its orbit is. But they do... They do, let me see. I want to see this star, K, K218. Can I see the constellation, please? Constellation. Compared to our other solar systems. So yeah, look how tiny the solar system is. All of the planets fit within the orbit of Mercury. It's like half the size of the orbit of Mercury. So this is a big planet, but it's orbiting very close to its star. I'm going to go back to, it's 124 light years from Earth. So let me see, 124 light years visualized. So 124 light years is a huge distance. But relatively speaking, relatively speaking, it's not a huge amount of time. So let me see. Alpha Centauri is 4.4 light years away. I think the Trappist system is closer than that, but how long to travel one light year? So I'm going to look that up. So with our current technology, they say these things were seen at Mach 2. So departing Earth, I mean, that's like the first link. I have a proponent of humanity becoming a multi-planet species. All right, dude. Like, thanks for... I mean, I guess this is your blog, so I can't really say anything. So to travel one light year, if we travel at the speed of light, it would take us one year to travel that distance. Feeling time would fly by in less than a second. That's actually not true, but it stops. Time stops for a man as he does aging as, as long as the space of travels at the speed of light. So that may not be true because we never traveled the speed of light. This is just what theoretically would happen. But anyway, anyway. So how long light moves in a year? Speed of light is two th um, 299 million seven hundred ninety-two thousand four hundred fifty-eight point five. He missed his point five. Point five meters per second. No, it is. It is. I, I forgot. It's kilometers per second would be 299,792.458. Yeah. So this is, this is super correct. This is meters per second. I thought this was like kilometers per second. One Julian year, the measure of how we measure it is 365.25 days or 31,500,000 seconds. A light year is equal to uh, 9.461 times 1,015 meters. So it's very, 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 very far. 
So this is what we have for the light year, this many meters. I'm gonna copy that. I can figure out by using math. So how fast is Raptor engine in meters per second? So I'm gonna see how fast a Raptor engine can go. This Raptor engine can go 1100. Raptor R reaches 100 to miles per hour. Let me see. Let me see. I, let me look at max speed. Max speed of Apollo of a Starship. Let's let's do Starship. That's a more recent aircraft. So SpaceX Starship. Oh, I like this page. See, SpaceX is sleek. They have good design. They're like the apple of space. Diameter, payload capacity. Let me see if they have any more. High diameter thrust. Propellant capacity, height. They're not giving me the data. I'm not getting the data. Why is this so hard to find, man? Why is it max velocity of Starship? I might even have to go to like a live stream, a SpaceX live stream just to grab this data. Yeah, I'm just going to go to a SpaceX launch and then first let me put in that many meters. And then I'm going to my ears to miles inverter. So I could also just put 124 light years in kilometers. All right. Can I, do I, do, I hate when I honestly, I, I can't lie guys. I absolutely cannot, I cannot stand scientific notation. Like you're like, oh, it makes things shorter. It's like, it makes plugging it into anything a pain in my ass. So I would rather them not do that. Let's see, calculate me. Okay, calculate me is based in red pill and actually gives me the full number instead of plebit tier scientific notation. So this many kilometers. Okay, so I'm going to go to the SpaceX live stream and I'm going to calculate this in real time. So bear with me. I'm going to go over here. So it's this many kilometers, 124 light years. That's how many kilometers from Earth this thing is. I mean, like, that's for reference. This is 130 uh, billion. That's the trillion. That's a, like a kajillion. I, I, I forget what's after a trillion. But anyway, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to space space x starlink launch all right so this is a starlink mission i'm gonna go into the middle of this we have a speed of 1,185 kilometers per hour. What's the max speed? 7,301. All right, this is at 13,369. It's at 15,085. It's 18,000, 20,000, 23,000, 24,000, 26,000. And it caps out, let's say it's at two, let's say 27,000 kilometers per hour 27,000 kilometers per hour if i divide that number so if i divide this amount by 27,000 it'll give me the number of hours that are left so i'll go to wolfram alpha i'll plug this guy in and we'll see So we want this number 
divided by 27,000. This can't be reduced. But, oh yeah. So this is like 40. <laughs> so this would take like 43 billion hours. Like 40, it's not reducible, but it's like, even if we round down, let's, let's say 43 billion hours. So let's see how much 1 billion hours is. So 1 billion hours in years. So hours to years. I'm going to say... Also, I love saving converters, a huge sucker. So this is going to be where's the where's the whole number version? They, do they not have the whole number version? It's I'll just I'm just gonna round down to forty three point four billion. For. So it says 35. See this see this is why I study zoology is I'm not trying to do all this math. Wait, can I can I not go further than that? No, I can. Two, three, four, five, six. So yeah, this is one thousandths place. This is million, four hundred forty million, forty-three billion. Yeah, it's thousand, it's a million, that's billion, 43 million. All right, so it would take, with our modern technology, seems like it would take 4,955,509 years. So almost 5 million years it would take us to get there. So that's a, if, we're, if we were you taking a Falcon rocket there, it would take us almost 5 million years to get there. So 124, 124 light years is still a massive distance away. So the big question that the NASA guy had is like, you know, that's a long distance if, if any extraterrestrial were to reach us from any system. But let's say like UAP max acceleration. So what's the acceleration of this UAP? So UAP is maintaining flight level, very low speed, executing sudden acceleration, executing angular changes in direction, executing 180 degree reversal in direction. So speed of light, so take 124 years at light speed. So at what fraction of light speed, how long would it take them? And what do they age or these crafts manned? So if this planet was legit, if they, we both had the same technology, it would take us 5 million years to meet each other. Even if we met in the middle, it would take two, almost like around two and a half million years. But if you have technology that is this advanced where you can manipulate gravity and you can manipulate time and yada, 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 then it becomes very, very probable that at least over time they could do this. Like if you're able to get up to 25% the speed of light, if you're able to get up to 10% the speed of light, you could, you could make this within one and a half centuries, which seems like a long amount of time, but it depends how long you can be under stasis. Like if these aliens put themselves into stasis, they could theoretically take centuries to get there. And then all they would have to do, if the, all the an advanced civilization would have to do is attain 1% speed of light. If they could attain 1% the speed of light, it would take them 1,240 years to reach that system, the K2, that K2, whatever 18 system and that exoplanet take them 1024 years. so if they were able to get to two percent the speed of light it would take them six centuries to get to earth so i mean it depends how much you want to go there. i mean if they could make it to five percent the speed of light if they could accelerate whether relativistically or in real time, like whether they're manipulating space time 
using gravity waves or whatever, or if they were just straight up able to go that fast using some hack or speed strat in the universe, if they were able to just make it to 5% the speed of light in any given craft, then they could make it to earth in half a, half a millennium. And that makes, that is, that seems like a long amount of time. It is a long amount of time, but that's a distance I would have taken them 5 million years with current technology. So if they could get to 5% the speed of light with a craft, relativistically speaking, and not even 50% of the speed of light, not 70, I mean like just 5% the speed of light, 5% the speed of light, then they could, they could make it to earth in, in 500 years. They could have left back during Henry VIII's reign, they, that, that means that any alien species that could leave that planet during Henry VIII's reign, if that's when they left the planet, if that's when takeoff occurred was during the rulership of Henry, Henry VIII, then they probably end up landing here sometime this month. That's a crazy thought. Like that's genuinely a crazy ass thought to have that something that would take us 5 million years with our fastest rockets to get to I mean, crap, dude, we, we would have to, to put this into perspective. If we went back 5 million years, went back 5 million years, it's literally Tarzan tier, fam. Like actual anatomically modern humans are not even around in the fossil record yet. And you're looking at some crazy, crazy, like, for example, gray wolves. Gray wolves, my guy, like a lot of species we think of today they're, they're just, I mean, it's like, honestly, it's, it's crazy to think how long it would take us with modern technology to get to these planets. But with our current technology, it's barely even a joke. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really hyped for what's happening in xenozoology. I think that NASA is lying to the American public. I'm going to come out and say it. It's, you cost the American taxpayer too much money. And I'm speaking not not to SpaceX. I'm, let me go back to let me go back to our homeboy. What is this guy's name? Where where is he? I'm gonna have to go right back to the NASA brief. Going right back to the NASA brief, new UFO report. And so I'm gonna show some of the actual UFO footage. So this is their independent study report. This guy, this guy needs to, and they don't have subtitles, but it's like, this guy needs to get real. This, this, it is a perfect example of just how entitled these politicians are. Cause you're a politician. I don't give a shit if you used to be an engineer, astronaut, whatever. You're a politician, bro. This organization is, is one of the most expensive organizations in government that is non-essential the military even if you disagree the military's budget military is essential for maintaining america's power projection and defending defending the country are they use are they useless as hell yes but they're intrinsically necessary for the for the country we don't need a space program we don't need a nasa so what we need is food what we need is defense we need is our strong borders what we need is job opportunities that we need are uh, cat girl girlfriends. That's what we need. We don't need you. We don't need NASA. NASA hasn't even got, got us to the moon since the Apollo program, program shut down. Your biggest, your, your most biggest claim to fame in recent years has been the space shuttle. And after that literally blew up in your faces in August of 2011, you haven't even had a space shuttle program which is egregiously expensive and never really actually did what it needed to do. The fact that SpaceX can run, can actually generate profit while doing what your space shuttle program was supposed to do is embarrassing. The fact that that Virgin space is up here flying people to Google and you couldn't even get your shuttle to work. Embarrassing. So NASA hasn't even touched its own research and development all that time. It's like, Oh, could NASA get us back to the moon? Like NASA couldn't even design its own rocket. You contract out to private agencies for everything you do the only thing you actually bring us are, are touched up photographs from a northrop grumman blood t blood satellite and touch up photos and give us some former cia navy seal astronauts like that's all the nasa does and then you you're over here given this importantly important serious task 
of telling us what, what goes on in space, like about these UAPs, about this whistleblower from intelligence agencies coming forward with all this, and you're just going to be tight lipped, but talk about transparency. See, people like this are, are why Donald Trump, for example, gutted the EPA. People like this are why folks don't trust politicians. People like this are why folks were not going and getting vaccines during the pandemic. Folks like this are why people keep guns around, not for home defense, but because of an eventual uprising. Because as long as people like this exist in our government that are flagrant and dismissive and honestly disrespectful when it comes to their existence, people will always naturally hate these folks. These will always be persona non grata. And it royally pisses me off that Guys like this guy, this guy, where am I pointing? This guy, guys like this guy are walking around and just being like, we're open and transparent, but oh, you want the facts? We only care about the facts and then won't provide the facts and won't be transparent himself. It's it's like a pastor that's like molesting his entire congregation of altar boys, then talks about chastity and purity. It's like the hypocrisy is so poignant, the hypocrisy is so there. And it's just right in everyone's faces. It's like, NASA, we know you're running a screen. We know you're setting a pick for the DOD and the Pentagon because you know the DOD and Pentagon are withholding a bunch of UAP data and you're hand-waving all that shit away. You're like, I've been with NASA for 50 years. And then, and then. it's like another old dude with a comb over is, is telling me how to think and dis dismissing important facts that have to pertain to these, these phenomena. So, yeah, guys. So that's my... That's my blood pressure. I So here's the thing. As xenozoology progresses, like I talked about, like, oh, I'm going to do drawings. Like, I'm going to cover this as it unfolds. Because I think, like, yeah, it's cute. I want to show you guys drawings. But it's like, I just suddenly saw an explosion of activity, an explosion of interest in this field from literally everybody. And I think it behooves me more so to cover the current events than it is to be larping and writing my own little fanfics like bill beridian about what life could look like i want to know about this like this is now something that i think is pretty pretty intriguing to to say the least it's the first time that i've been able to sit down and actually analyze for real a specimen that could have been xenozoological in origin an actual alien life form if not like even if it's just an assembled organism i'm still able to bring xenozoology into into the topic to debunk at least what I think is a hoax based on the fact that it doesn't have the hallmarks of an organism, what an organism should have based on the claims that are being provided. So it's been a very interesting week. This is where I'm going to go going forward. And I'll probably do some reiterations as things come out, as new events unfold, I'll, I'll probably cover these things in Xenozoology. And based on the upload schedule, uh, I think up next is my psychology of simping installment. And that one's going to cover that. I'm, I'm excited for that one because that's going to cover some uh, some of the recent like allegations that women have been making against powerful men. Uh, I talked about money doesn't make you a man in the last one. Now I'm going to talk about almost the opposite. Like, well, it's just what what does make somebody really be able to walk away from something and not just be a bitter, lonely male? So a lot of the things I find as like an issue in the MGTOW community, and I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to let this guy talk. So one of the things I, I've realized, for example, in like the MGTOW community is this whole thing about walking away. Like I'm not MGTOW. I'm not MGTOW. Like I total monk mode. It seems like I'm MGTOW, but I'm always open to dating. The difference is, is that I think that the attitude one should have is one of wariness. You should know yourself before you get to know someone else. But I also realized that when trying to deprogram a simp, like how do you acknowledge simping behavior? How do you repent for it? And But how do you also keep a woman intrigued? Because it's one thing to say to never simp, but it's also another thing to like, like dudes who like, oh, don't compliment women and don't like, dude, I'm trying to get y'all some stank on your Johnson. These guys aren't trying to do that. Like MG, MGTOW tattoos don't want you to go and look at women, interact with women. And that's literally gay. So that's not what I'm trying to do here. And so I think for the next one, I'm like, okay, the whiplash part of the psychology series is over. And now we're on true uh, habilitation, like the stages of uh, the stages of grief. It's like denial, anger, bargaining, and then finally acceptance. It's like you're, we're basically, we're basically at the, at the point where we've gotten over the anger and now we're at the bargaining. Like where we started at denial, like 
thou shalt not simp. We talked about like all the all the things that simps make us rage about. But now we're going to talk about the bargaining stage. Before we go on to acceptance, the acceptance that some men will always simp and other men will always be calling them out and that simps will keep ruining society because they throw around money, they throw around compliments, they keep orbiting when they shouldn't. The, the next stage is bargaining. Like how can you navigate and mitigate a life full of simps? How do you navigate and mitigate a dating game which is hyper-competitive and hypergamous to the core? So that's what I'm going to be covering next week. And then I'm going to be moving on to the middle Jurassic. So there's going to be a bare minimum three weeks. And then I also am moving to Hawaii next month. So that's a big thing. I'm starting actual conservation work, believe it or not. And yeah, I am. I'm kind of done with not doing things that are in my field. So I'm basically starting my career, which I, I'm still kind of in denial of it because life usually kicks me in the balls. Uh, so I'm pretty hyped for that. So I don't have to be doing stuff that I don't really want to do anymore. I can focus on doing my career and YouTube. And I think I'm hoping that as I enter this, I guess, new year for me, because I'm also my birthday's at the end of the month. So as I enter this new year of my life, I'm really going to be hoping that it's like, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I am really hoping that it's better than this last year because 2023, I don't think anybody looked at 2023 with optimism. I don't think anybody was like, Oh, 2023, it's going to be my year guys. Oh, we're really going to kill it in 2020. That was nobody. Nobody was like that. So uh, I'm hoping that 2024, <laughs> I think that I was like, I jinx myself every time. I'm like 2024 is going to be one of the years of all time. I hope it's great. I hope it's fun. But yeah, it might mean that well, I dropped my mic. It might mean that I take a little tiny break from the uploading. And also if I made somebody shit their pants because I dropped my mic, I apologize. But that's how that's going to be. Um, if there were some more people in chat, I would probably do a quick dojin reading. But I'm going to take a break from that from now. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for dropping in. Any Like a manual dropped in. Uh, I, he's probably going to be re-listening to this on the back, back ski. But again, I just want to thank everybody, everybody, like literally everybody who's ever showed up, ever lurked, ever left a comment, ever left a like, even it was to be a hater, even if you left the dislike, or not if you left the dislike, you can go fuck yourself if you left the dislike. But literally everyone else besides people left disliked that interacted with my channel, even if it was just to check me out for two seconds, thank you. And to the people who have subscribed to me, you know, help a brother out, share the message. I'm going to try to diversify, keep diversifying. But again, I'm always open to suggestions. Like the entire psychology of something series is because of my man, Emmanuel. He just randomly dropped it. He's like, oh, maybe you can do a series on something. And I literally did. So if you give me a comment, if you want me to cover something, I will absolutely cover it. Dudes want me to do dojin readings or talk about dolls. I will do dojin readings and talk about dolls. You want me to talk about animorphs? I will talk about animorphs. I will literally talk about anything you want me to talk about. I am not exaggerating. You don't got to pay me. There's no super chat. There's no nothing. Like literally just show up to my stream, leave a comment. Hell, if you even want to guest on my stream, just let me know. Um, but again, I show everybody's messages. If you want to interact with me live, you don't got to super chat me. If you want to talk to like, I don't care. Even once I'm monetized, I will still highlight or respond to anything anyone says. And if there's a thousand chats per minute and I do have to graduate to a system where I just highlight super chats and whatever. But again, I'm not here to grift. I've never been here to grift. I don't give a shit about the money. I'm planning to do other things with my life that make me money. And if YouTube makes me money and I make enough to do exclusive YouTube content, then I'll pour even more of my heart and soul into it. But this is the raw gritty me. And yeah, I hope this guy looks like a chubby Steve Carell. Uh, but yeah, I hope that you guys have enjoyed my channel so far to me a hundred subscribers is a huge milestone so again thank you guys and uh, also Streamyard, i'm gonna try to keep it under 20 hours this month you small hat mofos trying to be like oh we're not gonna you you can oh you you've you've streamed 14 hours you've streamed 14 hours this month that's that's more than 90 percent of the people on the free service huh if you go over 20 we're not going to stop you from streaming in the middle of your stream. We're going to prevent you from streaming again until you get premium. So yeah, I can't be, I can't be grinding out these four. I can do like literally exactly four hours of content 
every single uh, every single week. So like my streams, basically, they're forcing me to end my streams uh, in the uh, yeah at, at around like maybe the three hour fifty minute mark. So yeah, guys, that's just how how it is. I can do like a four hour stream every once in a while, but sadly, I can't do like my super long super long. I mean, three and a half hours versus four hours. I mean, stop being, stop bitching. But anyway, guys, thank you so much. Again, leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, hit that bell icon to hit me next week. And yeah, I'll see you guys with the new installment of psychology is something fresh off the baker next Sunday. So thanks for attending. Sayonara and have a fantastic weekend, folks. Peace.